Hello, this is Patrick Daly and welcome to Interlinks. Interlinks is a program about international business and globalisation and the effects these have had on our life, our work and our travel over the last 50 years or so. In each program, we interview a person from another country or with strong connections to another country to get their unique perspective on these matters and how they have affected their life, their work and their business. There's a little bit of history, a dash of economics, a sprinkling of business and an overlay of personal experience from both me and my interviewees from around the world. Today we will be talking to Linda Henman from St. Louis, Missouri in the United States. Linda is known as the Decision Catalyst and she's a speaker, consultant and she advises executives and boards on mergers and acquisitions, strategy, change and growth. So I am delighted to be joined on the line by Linda Henman from St. Louis, Missouri in the United States. Hi Linda, how are you? I'm good, Patrick. How are things in Ireland? Excellent, excellent. Many thanks for being with us today. I'm happy to be here. Great. So, Linda, uh, you're in St. Louis in Missouri in the United States. Now, in Ireland, we're quite familiar with places like Boston and New York, but maybe not so much with, with St. Louis. Could you situate St. Louis for us on the map? Where Where is it? How big is it? And what's it like in terms of climate and geography, population and the origins of the people who live there and so on? Well, I love talking about St. Louis, but in St. Louis, we do not have the French pronunciation. We we say (laughs) yes on the end of Louis, uh, like our founders probably would have liked for us to have done. We are smack dab in the middle of the United States. So we're partway, halfway from the East Coast, halfway from the West Coast, halfway from the North, halfway from the South. So if you were throwing a dart at the middle of a map of the United States, it would land near or on St. Louis. Mm -hmm. We are to the very eastern part of Missouri. In fact, we sort of stick into Illinois. There's a little, um, if you look at a map, there's a little bump that goes into Illinois. And so we are a unique culture. We are a combination of many things. We're sort of what uh, we call ourselves mutts. (laughs) <laughs> because we are a, not a specific breed, we have a little of each breed. My theory is that in the establishment of St. Louis, that many of the religious orders from Europe decided to save the heathens in the colonies. So they <laughs> sent all their nuns and priests and brothers and told them to go as far as they dared go and then establish a community. Well, they got to St. Louis, they managed to to cross the Mississippi River, and then I think all of these good people said, this is far enough, we're not going to go into the wilderness, let's establish communities here. So we have some of the best schools and some of the best hospitals that these orders, primarily of nuns, started Mm -hmm. here in St. Louis. We have a very high Catholic population In fact, we have uh, the largest per capita Catholic population in the U.S., and that means we have many all-girls and all-boys schools. In fact, within 10 miles of me, I think that there are 10 such schools. My children went to the uh, all-girls schools, and now my grandchildren are going to all-girls and all-boys school. This is very unusual for uh, towns in the United States. I understand it's very common in Ireland, mm-hmm. but it's very unusual here. And your your own heritage then? So you've got a great mix there. I know the, the Germans feature highly, the Irish, and then later the Afri- African-Americans. And I know even in the 20th century, there was an influx of uh, Bosnians after Yugoslavia uh, uh, disintegrated. So w- what's your own what's your own heritage? Well, my own ethnicity is Irish, and I claim it very proudly. When I was in school, my father was in the Air Force, so we called ourselves Air Force brats, and we moved all over. And when I was in um, junior high school, it was uh, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, we lived in California in Fairfield, and a group of Irish nuns taught us there, the Holy Faith Sisters, who have their mother house right there in Ireland with you. Mm -hmm. It's on the outskirts of town. And so those women became very influential in my own life, and I still stay connected to the sisters. There are, most of them are in their 80s now, the ones who taught me anyway. They have some younger ones that are there in Ireland. But um, they sent these nuns at great sacrifice to their own order to the U.S., and I am very grateful that they did because I credit them with much of my success of teaching me how to learn and teaching me especially English. They were very good at that. 
So I love tracing my ancestry. I've been to Ireland several times. My family comes from a very small town in Cork called Kilworth. Mm-hmm. And I am of Condon descent, and apparently we have 26 castles in Ireland. <laughs> okay. I have visited two of them, and one of my grandmothers was a mower, so I'm claiming the Cliffs of Mower, too. Okay, great. <laughs> That's brilliant. So today, then, uh, St. Louis... Uh, if I can say it correctly this time. It has a central geographical location in the U.S., so I, I expect it's a kind of a transportation logistics hub. So what is the economy like today? I know names like Wells Fargo and Monsanto are associated with St. Louis, but what's it, what's it like economically today? We are experiencing much of the boom that the rest of the U.S. is experiencing. We have some companies that are uh, headquartered here. You mentioned a couple. Monsanto is now Bayer. And they have just built a new building. Pfizer is here. Uh, Boeing is here. And you mentioned uh, Anheuser-Busch, which is now InBev, Mm -hmm. a Belgian company, bought it. But they are still headquarters here. So our employment is, we are almost fully employed, as are most other cities in the U.S. So it's a good time for us, as is every place else. Okay. If If we could get this coronavirus figured out, that's causing the U.S. economy to have some problems. Yeah, and it's causing the European economy to have lots of problems as well. All right, everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Um, everybody, I think, probably recognizes the uh, the iconic gateway arch in, in St. Louis, but w- what's the significance of that arch, and what does it actually represent? Well, it was built in the late 60s and into the early 70s. It was meant to be a symbol of the gateway to the West, So as I was talking about earlier about these groups of nuns and priests that got this far, thousands of other people got this far too. So it's honoring those who went further into the West than St. Louis. They didn't stop here. They went on and then uh, started the trek, which was, as you know, deadly for lots of people. So it's a symbol of expansion into the West and how the rest of the Western part of the United States grew in the early part of our country. Mm -hmm. And uh, the city is right at the the eastern side of the state of Missouri on the Mississippi uh, River. And the state of Missouri came into the Union around 1821. And it's one of those states that had a kind of ambiguous role in the the Civil War. So formerly it it, it was a slave state, but it was claimed by both the Confederacy and, and the Union. Uh, and we had this, you know, the, this militia activity went on and you have these names like uh, Jesse and Frank James and the Younger Brothers. So what, what was Missouri's role in the Civil War? And who are these characters, these uh, James Brothers and the Younger Brothers? Well, first, Patrick, you never cease to amaze me with your knowledge of history. In addition <laughs> to knowing European, you know more about U.S. history than most Americans do. The, Missouri was a very conflicted state. As I said, we are in the middle of everything, and we were in the middle of that war. So we have a southern charm to us, and we have northern practicality to us. Mm-hmm. So during the Civil War, there were people called the Bushwhackers, which were, these people were sympathetic to the Confederate states. Some people had slaves in Missouri, but other people in Missouri did not approve of what was going on in the Confederacy, and they thought Missouri should be a free state. So we had an intra-state civil war that was going on simultaneously with the uh, national civil war, the war between the North and the South. It was a very tumultuous time, and in it, there came some characters as the Jesse James and Frank James and the Younger Gang, some of these that you mentioned. They had started out as being pro-Confederate. So to those who were fighting on the side of the Confederacy, they were somewhat folk heroes um, because they seemed to be fighting for something that a great number of people believed in. However, they took a wrong turn and they started fighting for their own profit. And that was they robbed banks, they robbed trains, and they started committing other kinds of crimes, violence associated with some of these robberies, as you might guess. They were very colorful, and they took their loot to a a system of caves that's here in St. Louis called the Merrimack Caverns. If you or anyone listening ever gets to Missouri, be sure to plan that on a hot summer day, because it's about five miles of caves that the 
these gangs used for hideouts and safekeeping. So it's a very cool way to escape summer heat in the uh, summertime here. <laughs> and it's also very educational about how caves are formed and uh, what they look like now. Okay, great. We're going to turn our, our attention now to your own business. And uh, in the intro, I, I spoke a little bit about what you do, some of the things you do, um, that you're known as the Decision Catalyst. Your business is the Henman Performance Group. So could you tell us a little bit about what, what you do, who you do it for, and what ways your client's condition has improved after you've been working with them? I say that I help those in the C-suite make decisions that they can't afford to get wrong. So the decision catalyst means I help them with the decision. I don't impose a decision on them or tell them what the decision should be. I help them figure out what they want the answer to be. So I work with those in the C-suite primarily, but these that would also be a business owner of a smaller company, or it would be somebody who is a vice president of a large company to help that person with profit and loss responsibilities. The decisions that I make help them make come in basic two buckets, if you will. Mm -hmm. One is strategy. What are we trying to do and why are we trying to do that? And the second is who? Who will we have do whatever it is that we're doing? So the question I ask when I meet someone is, what do you want to be true a year from now that is not true now? And they will give me a laundry list of things about how they want things to be different. And then I usually have to pull them back to the original question of saying, what will you want to be different? And how will you know, how will we know that it's different? Not how will we do it, but how will we measure it? So uh, as those of us in Alan Weiss's community say, it's objectives, measures, and values. What do you want to do? How will you know when you've done it? And what good will it do you? So those are the kinds of questions I help. And, and by having that sort of process-driven business, I am able to help decision makers in, in any industry. I've been doing this for more than 40 years, so there aren't too many industries I have not touched. But even if I were to go into an industry I had never worked in, I would be able to help them with their decisions because decision-making is, is no different. Yeah. And th th this thing about decision making, uh, I work with lots of companies and I find um, um, a level of paralysis sometimes, dithering and indecision, people having great difficulty making decisions. Um, wh what do you think is going on there? I guess you see that kind of thing as well. What's actually going on uh, in their heads that's, that's causing this uh, paralysis? Invariably, it's someone's attempt to make the very simple complex now, why they do that differs quite a bit. Sometimes people will say, when, when people say to me, oh, well, it's complicated, my usual response is, well, then let's make it simple. Put it in one sentence. Put the problem in one sentence. And if they get that sentence right, then we are off to the races of making the decision or solving the problem. If they get the decision wrong, then they will be distracted by all of these emotional and inconsequential kinds of things. And as I often say to my children, which I've never had the nerve to say to a client, I will say, well, that's interesting, but irrelevant. Let's get back to the relevant. I mean, you're laughing like a father, Patrick. I think you've been tempted to say this to your children as well. The other thing I've said to my kids that I won't say to clients is I can't help you if you're going to be stupid. And, exactly. and introducing irrelevant information into problem solving and decision making will only cause a distraction. Mm -hmm. You mentioned already your fa family connection to the U.S. Uh, military, but later uh, in your career, you were involved in a research project on American uh, POWs from the Vietnam War. Uh, what was the purpose of that research and what were the findings and outcomes? Well, there is what I tell people and there's the real reason, so I'll give both. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I was going through a divorce in 1995. 1994 when I started my uh, doctoral research and I decided that I wanted to study a group of people who had bounced back from adversity. Now we know that the military members who were imprisoned in the South and those who served in the South, the young enlisted men who were drafted to fight in the Vietnam War, are having terrible problems uh, now as they are approaching 
uh, their senior years. Mm -hmm. These these people have post traumatic stress disorder. They have trouble with alcoholism, homelessness, and generally mental illness. But I didn't want to study that group. I wanted to study the group who had been imprisoned in the north, the aviators who flew over Hanoi and were shot down, because those men have almost no post traumatic stress disorder. In fact, even when I was involved in the twenty year follow up we found that their post-traumatic stress disorder was no higher than the people in an average city who had had natural disasters or had been victims of violent crimes. So I was very curious about what it took to bounce back. And of course, you know, my personal question was, and we usually go into research for our personal reasons, is I wanted to know what it was going to help to take me what it was going to, uh, what I was going to have to do to bounce back from the adversity that I had been immersed in, mm-hmm. and so it was almost like a religious retreat for me to do this discovery, and then from that I have been able to help my clients through times of adversity and chaos. For example, I just got an email this morning that we're changing a coaching engagement that I have with a financial management company who's very involved in Wall Street. We started the coaching engagement before the coronavirus affected our numbers here on Wall Street. And so uh, Steve is the man I'm working with. I have to adjust my coaching in how I am going to help him help his team get through the chaos that the next few weeks, and I hope not longer than a few months, will probably entail. In your in your consult in your consultancy work, do you work internationally currently, or are you seeking to work internationally, or do you concentrate mainly in the United States? Well, most of, currently, most of my clients are in the U.S. I have worked for large companies in manufacturing, and then we had several times that I was working overseas with the people who were running an office. So they were American-owned companies but they had offices in uh, China and in Europe and in different places. And so I was working with their executives, usually on the phone or on Skype. Uh, One of us was in our bathrobe a lot of times, it it was China, (laughs) uh, as we were doing this kind of work. Um, Now I work with consultants in Europe. And um, so that's the, the extent of my international work right now. Yeah, and the, the, the way the world is um, has evolved over the last uh, 30, 40, 50 years, we've seen this growing economic globalization that allows many of us to work uh, internationally. And I guess the coronavirus is a manifestation of that because China is now so connected into the global economy that when something happens there that may have been isolated 40 years ago when China was cut off from the world, now spreads rapidly. But it seems that the process of economic globalization is in a bit of a, uh, an inflection point. So we have Brexit, we have trade wars, we have protectionism and so on. What's your own perspective on that uh, with regards to globalization, its pros and, and, and cons? And where do you think we're at? Are we stalled? Are we heading backwards? Or is this, is this just a blip? Well, I am not a chicken little who says, oh, my goodness, look at this. The sky's falling. The sky is falling. I think we're going through a very weird time in our global economy. Uh, I don't know what's going to come of Brexit. I wish that we could turn back the hands of the clock to a time when somebody said, why was this a good idea to put this to a vote in the first place? People were voting on something that they did not understand. And as you know, of course, then it dragged out and people became more polarized. And as it became more polarized in Britain, it was very polarizing throughout Europe. And if it happens in Europe, it happens in the U.S. and vice versa. And so I think that it's going to take some time for people to sort out all the unintended consequences to Brexit to figure out exactly what's going to happen. And then for somebody to say, OK, we this did not go as planned or this is did go as planned and we're happy with it, whatever it is, but then to make a decision to put it back on track, whatever that means, down the road once all of the uh, the fur has quit flying there. So, of, of course, it, in a global economy, whatever happens in Europe, and, and I know in Ireland, it's um, you have two kinds of things represented in the north and in the south, so it's very likely to affect your economy and, and what's going on there. As far as China, uh, things were complicated before this coronavirus. What I'm seeing in my manu- my manufacturing clients are hit the hardest with this. 
because they have uh, American companies, large manufacturing companies here that have their satellite companies in China. So they can't send their executives back and forth. They cannot uh, send their par the, the parts back and forth. The economy in China is taking a hit because people aren't going to work, people are sick, people are quarantined. And so this is just going to take a while to figure this out. And then the other element to this is taxation, that the U.S. needs to figure out how we want to tax big business in the U.S. because we don't want American companies going overseas where the taxation is lower. But we need revenue from taxation, as you might imagine. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's just a chaotic time, no matter which lens you look through. Yeah, there are no easy answers, but I, I, I like everybody I bring on the program. I ask them that question because I'm just very interested in everybody's different different perspectives. So thank you very much for, for your perspective. Another thing you mentioned earlier was uh, strategy and strategy development that you do in your work. And one of the things that I encounter with business people when we're trying to talk about strategy is this uh, tendency to get drawn down into uh, tactics, this tension between strategy on the one hand and planning and execution on the other. And lots of, lots of businesses have difficulty with that. Um, what's your perception of that and how does it manifest for you with, with clients? And what do, you, what do you do about it? I only have tr strategy discussions at the highest levels of the organization. So a few things you need if you're going to really have a strategy formulation period in the, in, uh, or workshop, whatever you want to call it. First of all, you have to be dealing with strategic thinkers, that if you're dealing with tactical thinkers, they are immobilized by strategy discussions. So what do I mean by that? Once again, strategy is about what and why, and tactics are about how. Mm -hmm. So people want to lead with what they know. So if I am in HR and I know how to produce reports, and I know how to organize systems, or if I'm in technology and I know what sort of technical support we have, that those kinds of things justify my existence. Therefore, I want to talk about them and make sure you appreciate what I'm doing for you uh, as my boss. But they are not strategic, strategy discussions. So... When we talk to somebody in technology, for example, they may want to say, well, the newest, latest, greatest technology is this, and we can do all these kinds of things like that. And then I say, why do you want to? Well, because it's the latest and it's the greatest. It'll save time and, and it'll do all these, these tricks. And I'll say, well, why is that important? Mm -hmm. Well, if you go back to, we are trying to ed, uh grow the company. We we want to grow the company by 10% and we want to concentrate on growth in the northeast United States. Well, technology may or may not play a role in that goal, but everybody wants a seat at the table. Uh, so I, I say there are certain parts of a company like HR, technology, and legal that are not profit and loss centers. And Depending on the day and my mood, I will often call these business prevention units because <laughs> not only do they not make money for the company, they prevent the company from making money. Mm -hmm. But I know you do a lot of work in supply chain, right, Patrick? Correct. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Technology can play a huge role in setting the strategy there. So if we wanted to... Um, if we wanted to improve service to our clients, and, and that's the other thing, people too often take their eyes off the client or the customer when they are talking about strategy. If we are not getting our products to our customers as fast as our competitors are, and technology plays a role in that, then they need to be at the table. Because now we're talking about using technology to make money, not just to have the coolest toy that, that we can have. And so, first of all, you have to have very few people in a strategy discussion because if you don't uh, isolate and concentrate, then you will wander off in all these other irrelevant directions. You have to have strategic thinkers. Usually, not always, but usually someone running a company or running a major division of a company will have 
decent critical thinking skills. Otherwise, that person probably wouldn't have been promoted to the position in the first place. But as people go up the ladder in organizations, the lack of critical thinking skills or strategic thinking skills usually becomes apparent. But sometimes people get really good at hiding their limitations by turning the discussion to tactics. So when you have somebody who consistently insists on taking the decision back to a tactical discussion, suspect that you have a tactical thinker in the room Mm -hmm. and you need to get that person out of the room and a strategist thinking with you. That's a great, great, great uh, perspective, great answer. Really enjoy that. We're going to change uh, direction again now as we come into the final part of the interview. So what do you like to do in your discretionary time when, when you're not working on or in your business? Well, I have six grandchildren, Patrick, so okay. that, is, yeah. that is the highlight of my life. Four of them are in St. Louis, and four of them play sports year round. So if I got paid minimum wage to sit on bleachers, <laughs> I could retire on easy street. Okay. But that is how I spend my time and how I want to spend my time. When I'm not doing that, when I'm alone, I love to read and I love to read fiction. And have you and read, that, have, you, have you read anything lately that inspired you that you would recommend to, to listeners? Well, I've read, I usually don't read fiction for inspiration. I read it for entertainment. But one of the things that I've read that was inspiring is a book called Factfulness by Hans Oh, yes, yes, Rosner. I've read it. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. But... it's a very optimistic book. And in fact, I'm using it as a foundation and, and a research book for my upcoming book, which is called Risky Business, How to Develop a Disruptive Mindset. Because I think that if we go into every situation with fear, that we limit ourselves, we quit taking risks, and therefore we quit growing our companies and we quit improving ourselves because we're afraid of failure. You cannot be afraid of failure. Yeah. So that's, that's the most inspirational book I've read there. But I do love the Irish authors. In fact, I am, will be attending the Dublin Writers' Conference in June oh, to excellent. learn how to write my own novel because I've never attempted that. Oh, And you're going you're gonna to give that a go? I'm going to give it a go. Excellent. Look forward to that. So how could people then find out more about more about you, more about your work, your thinking and, and your business, your own your own books, uh, your web, social media and so on? Well, first of all, I have a brand new website that I am so proud of. So please visit www.henmanperformancegroup.com. I'll spell that H-E-N-M-A-N performance, P-E-R-F-O-R-M-A-N-C-E group, G-R-O-U-P dot com. And you'll find all kinds of articles and tip sheets and other resources on the website. Then I am the author of seven books, and you can get them all on Amazon or whatever um, place that you can buy books Mm -hmm. online in Ireland or in the U.S. And um, in those, I not only talk about what I do, I talk about how I do it. So any aspiring consultants who want to know my approach to things like strategy, which we discussed today, that would be in landing in the executive chair. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Linda. As, as always, the, uh, the clock beats us on, on this program. We could go on chatting and talking for quite a while. Um, that was fascinating, and it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you today. Thank you for being with us from St. Louis, Missouri, USA. It was a pleasure being with you, Patrick. Thanks also to our listeners, and remember that if you would like to find out more about globalization, international business, and how we can help you to formulate and implement business strategies that deliver, please check out my blog and website website on albalogistics.com and my book International Supply Chain Relationships which can be purchased on Amazon and Google Books. This is Patrick Daly of Alba Consulting. Goodbye and keep working.